You're listening to Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter. That's me, your naturally platinum blonde pop culture connoisseur. I'm the reality TV junkie, self-improvement addict, and host with only the hottest tea spilled fresh weekly. For more hot takes, go and give me a follow at Just Plain Zach. I always keep it funny and I always keep it cute. And if you're like me and you want to stay up to date with the latest reality tea, then go and give us a follow at No Filter with Zach on the Instagram. Or you can always join our private Facebook group. The link is in the description below. I hope right now you are sipping on some fizzy housewives inspired wine for yourself, packing a punch at 13% alcohol by volume, but less than a gram of sugar. It is my no filter wine. Look at that. No filter wine. Today we've got out cut down my drinking or what? Or what? Um, I hope you are drinking some today because guess what? It's my fucking birthday. Um, it's so interesting because I'm normally not like a big birthday person. I'm normally like, I don't want to celebrate my birthday. I don't want to do anything. Uh, that's so weird. But like, you know, as many of you guys have known, as I've opened up, I went through the grieving process in 2021 coming into 2022. And if anything, it's just made me develop such a deeper appreciation for not just life, because that sounds cl- so cliche, like, oh, life is short, life is finite, make sure you live every day like it's going to be your last, because you never know when it is going to be your last. I mean, yes, all of that's true. But I will say, it's just made me Because as you guys know, Melissa Rivers was recently on the show, love and adore Melissa Rivers. She was talking about how when she lost her mother, the first year, you know, was challenging. But the second year was a lot harder because you've gone through that first year of grief and like all of the firsts. Right. And then when you come into year two, it really becomes about acceptance of like, oh, now life just goes on. Now my life just continues without you. And so. For me, there are a lot of little moments that have come up, like when Melissa Rivers was booked on the show. And I was like, oh, my God, I wanted to call my Graham, who I've told you guys was like my mother. Um, and I wanted to call her and be like, oh, my God, Graham, like, yes, it's Melissa. Remember, we used to watch Melissa and Joan. We love Joan. We love Bachelor Police, like all the things. Right. And it's, so it's those little moments that you kind of are just like, oh, shit, I don't have. You know, I remember going to the doctor's office for the first time. Um, or having to go see a specialist, not my regular doctor, but having to go see a specialist and fill out like the emergency, um, the in case of emergency contact. And she was always my my ice, my in case of an emergency. And I remember sitting in the doctor's office, and this was maybe like two months after she had passed away. And I just remember being like, oh, I don't have my in case of an emergency anymore. Like if in case of an emergency, like I need to think of somebody else. Like, like she's gone. She just doesn't exist anymore. And that was like such a mind warp, such a mind fuck to like you'd think about um and process and be like, oh, my person is gone. The one person that I always went to for everything is now gone. My anchor is gone. So this past year has been challenging. And if anything, it's made me appreciate all of not the big moments, not the birthdays, not the Christmases, not the, you know, celebrations, but the little moments of, you know, the everyday kind of simple things that I miss that I wish I still had to hold on to. Um, and so it's made me want to celebrate my birthday this year. I'm 29 today. It is my last year of my 20s. I want to do a year of yes. I want to live life, have fun, and just, you know, live it up. I'm so excited to turn 30. I can't wait. This is my 12-month countdown to turning 30. I cannot wait to be in my 30s. I know that's the unpopular opinion. But listen, there's Botox and there's filler and my hair, you know, my face, everything's freshly done. Everything's freshly, you know, I'm I'm bleached, I'm bronzed, and I'm Botoxed. My asshole still looks the same. I didn't bleach that yet. But, you know, listen, maybe in my 30s, life will change. Maybe in this year of yes, life will change. But to celebrate, I hope you are drinking some no filter wine because I know I'm ready to get Liddy City this weekend and I hope you get Liddy City with me. So to my fellow Geminis, happy birthday. Also, if you are watching this right now, I'm so excited to announce that we've just launched our No Filter Wine subscriptions because I want to celebrate with you all summer long. So if you want to not just order No Filter Wine at nofilterwine.com, you can subscribe to No Filter Wine and get your orders sent to you on the regs. That way you're getting Liddy City on the regs all summer long and we can celebrate my birthday all summer long and get lit. 
You can go to nofilterwine.com, select the no filter variety packs. And when you're going to check out, when you decide how many cans you want to order, you can now select how often you want to get your orders. So you can just get them sent to you regularly. You know, it's just, it's a fun little subscription. That way you don't have to remember to have to restock and reorder. You'll just be stocked for the summer. And not only that, but for members that join our wine subscription, I'm going to be doing a Liddy City monthly happy hour at the start of every month. It's going to be a private Zoom link. So it's not an Instagram live. It's not a YouTube live. It's just for us wine subscribers that get to join in and get lit together and have a fun little virtual happy hour via the Zoom. It is private. You can get on video. We can chat. We can dish. We can spill the shit. I can give you real tea that I can't release anywhere else because I trust you because you're ordering the wine and we're going to get Liddy City together. So if you want to order your No Filter Wine subscription, you can get the rosé and the white available now at nofilterwine.com. Again, select the variety pack and then select the frequency you want to get. And every six months, I will be sending you a free gift, something that I've designed, a personal piece of like merch, a little something special that you'll get every six months when you subscribe to No Filter Wine. So go to nofilterwine.com. I'm very excited about today's guest. He is the host of the very funny podcast, Everything Iconic, the best-selling author of How Do I Unremember This? Unfortunately, True Stories. And what I'm saying is going to be Andy Cohen's future replacement. Please welcome Danny Pellegrino. Hello. Thank you. What an intro. I'm so happy we're finally able to do this. It's been, I feel like it's been a long time coming, but I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. Congrats on the New York Times bestseller list. Thank you. You did something Lala Ken could not. It's a weird list. There's, it's a weird list, but I'm, I'm very proud of the book and, and I'm happy people embraced it and, and bought it. And any of your listeners, go buy it. Yes. Is guys. that a gross thing to say, Zach? No, you need to pimp your, You need to Bethany <laughs> Frankel the shit out of your right. book, Danny. Everybody right. go by How Do I Unremember This? It's in my uh, Amazon storefront in Bravo Book Club. The book's there, so you guys can just order it there. But um, it's available on Amazon. Go to the stores. Go to the Barnes & Noble because you like to support bookstores. You know, we want to do I that. I do. I do. I love to support a bookstore. I go to those Barnes & Noble in, uh, here in Studio City quite a bit. Oh, I, I love it. Go to an in- indie bookstore. If you don't want to pay for it, go to the library. Request it at the library. That's good, too. Do you do the the reality star thing and go in the books and sign them and then say, hey, guys, on Instagram story, I just signed this book at <laughs> Barnes & Noble at the Grove. Come and get it. I did that. the OK, so I did that the other day and I because I, I was there and the books were there and I was like, I feel I felt so weird, though. And I kind of felt like I was vandalizing books because I didn't tell anyone at the, that worked at the store. Are you supposed I, to tell them? I don't know. I felt so awkward, though. I did a I did like half of them on the shelf. And then I was like, I feel weird about it. I, d- I never know. Like, are you supposed to go and be like, hi, can I speak to the store manager? I wanted to sign a copy of my own book. Or do you just kind of secretly go in and do it? I never knew. I know. Well, I think that I think you're supposed to tell them. I didn't tell them because I was uncomfortable, but I think you're supposed to tell them because they could put a sticker on the yeah, book that, that says, says signed. it's signed. But And then um, they put it in the special shelf that's signed by the author. That's really just the overstock books of people that didn't buy them when they came to the books out, the book signing. Yeah. I need to stay away from bookstores though, because I have literally a shelf of books that I've, I need to read that are just, I keep getting more and I need to stop buying more. I am the same. And I literally, so I have an infrared sauna right here in my living room and it's literally, I don't even use it because it's literally just filled with books because my bookshelves and everything are so full of books that I just now use it as storage for my books. Okay, wait, Zach, I need to ask you about this, the infrared <laughs> sauna of it all, because there's this like hot guy that I follow on Instagram that, uh-huh. you know, we all have those hot followers that it's like, I'm not really that interested in what he's doing, but he always is taking videos without his blouse on. And he's got an infrared sauna and I, and I'm sort of fascinated by it because it's like a separate, is that how yours is? It's like a separate thing that you can, it's not necessarily attached to the house, right? Right. You can so, like, it's portable. Okay. So you don't use it, though. I used to use it until it became storage for my books. Okay. Okay, because I saw it and I was like, I kind of want one of those, but I don't want to spend the money like a Peloton or something. And then where I'm never, I I use it for a week and then I never use it again. Well, see, this is why you have to do like an influencer deal. And you're like, hey guys, I'll promote your infrared sauna. I'll do a thirst trap of me in the sauna if you send me one. And I'll talk about all the healing benefits of cellular detox. Okay. 
you need to send me the company info because I will do that. <laughs> I actually, I, I know of a great sauna that you like. The one that I have here only because I'm in downtown LA. So like space is a little more confined when you're in the buildings. Um, so the one that I have here is like a desk one. So this wasn't like an endorsement. And I don't even know if the company is still around. Cause I got this one years ago. Um, but it's like a desk one where you like sit in it and I have my MacBook there and I can like work in there. But now I, I don't even use that MacBook. It's just collecting dust. Interesting. Interesting. Well, <laughs> I'm fascinated by the separate sauna thing because I, I literally was just looking at one and I was like, I, I feel like I can't spend the money on it because it would just sit and like yours become a drying rack or, or but, something for but if other you, goods. If you buy it, then you'll have, you'll see it and it's, it, there in front of me, you're like, I have to do it. I have to sweat it out, you know? And then just be like Emily and bring a sandwich in there and you can like do work. Like you have options, you know? <laughs> okay, last season of The Real House, we're just jumping into Housewives because last season of Orange County was terrible, but that was a good moment. That was a great moment. That was, a, was good a good gift moment. moment, yes. Yeah, yeah, we'll okay. give them that. Okay, so you your book is called How Do I Unremember This? But you've actually co-authored two books prior to this, right? With Tom and Ariana and then with Bob Harper. I did, yes. I was sort of a, a ghostwriter. Technically, I'm I'm a co-author of those, but uh, it's pretty much the same as ghostwriting. So, can you explain the difference? So, because ghostwriter is somebody that writes the book on behalf of the person, but a co-author, you it's more collaborative, right? Yeah, I mean, the term is a little bit. It, it kind of encompasses everything because every situation is different. When you're a ghostwriter, some author, some of the, if you pair up with a celebrity, sometimes they want to have more input in it into the book than other times. And so ghostwriting sort of encompasses it all. The ghostwriter is the one usually who's putting the book together. Uh, but uh, sometimes it, it depends on the scenario. Like every book is different. There was that whole argument on the Real Housewives of New York of whether or not Carol had a ghostwriter. I actually don't think she had a ghostwriter, but uh, I think she had like a more involved editor. Uh, but I think it, the term is kind of loose and it always depends on who the the person is. So, um, you know, when you look at the world of housewives, some housewives, I think like Bethany Frankel might have a little more input in her books and she might work a little bit uh, differently than someone like Ramona, who probably hired the ghostwriter who did the whole thing. And maybe she had a couple meetings with that person or on the Real Housewives of New Jersey, we watch Margaret have meetings with her ghostwriter. Uh, and so they would sit and talk and then the ghostwriter would go out and work. Um, and then a co-author, yeah, usually a co-author has a little bit more creative input in terms of like the crafting of the book um, and and maybe like the the title or the those kinds of things. Did that make any sense? Yes. And so okay. you did not have a ghostwriter for your book, right? No, no, I would no, imagine no. at this point you're ready. Yeah, to I was a ghostwriter before. So that was my profession before. So I always knew I wanted to write my own book. Uh, and so... This was the the culmination of that, and I was finally able to with with my book. How do I unremember this? But uh, yeah. So, what made you want to write? Because the book's a lot more personal than I think people would expect. I think people would expect like a housewives book or something that's like super, you know, celebrity pop culture e, and less is like less uh, peeling back the curtain and kind of getting an inside look into your life. Yeah, you know, I always wanted uh, the book to be sort of my version of a David Sedaris book. I grew up loving essay collections. And so I, as a writer, before getting into the podcast space, I always knew that that was the ultimate goal was to be able to write books like that, that I liked. And so I wanted it to be funny and also heartfelt. And there's a couple chapters in it that are a bit more dramatic, but ultimately I wanted it to feel like you could pick up the book, read a chapter, hopefully have some laughs. And then I... I love the world of Bravo and Housewives, and there's some references and some uh, some Housewife little tidbits in there throughout. But for the most part, I didn't want it to be a Bravo book or or a celebrity book. I just wanted it to be a book of my silly stories that hopefully make people laugh because those are the books that I like. And so, yeah, some people might might not like it, but <laughs> hopefully, people pick it up and have some laughs and. And yeah, well, this is the season to pick up a good like beach read, a good summer by the pool read with some of my no filter wine. Guys, go and order his book. Right. Right I know. Now. Get the get the wine, drink by the pool, read the book. I need yeah. to send you some wine, Danny. You need to send me your address so I can I get know, you some I wine. I got to try it. Are I you one? Are it. you one of those sober people? Don't tell me you're one of those sober people. 
No, I'm not one of those sober okay. people, but I, I've been sort of not drinking much, but not for any sort of reason other than I just have. It's been, you know, I go through spurts. Up yes. And, down. and to clarify, like, I'm not, I'm not knocking people that are like, have an addiction. I'm knocking people yeah, that course. are like, I don't like the taste of alcohol or I don't like the way it makes me feel like what you don't like that. It takes away your problems. Like what, who are you? <laughs> like who doesn't, who doesn't enjoy a good, a good no filter wine available. At no, filter no I, I need to try the no filter wine. I'm going to try it because I do also love a canned alcohol. Well, it's pool safe and it's easy to like sneak into your pocket to like sneak into your Uber. Or if you're like going out for the night, you know, I they made that. sure you know it's convenient. Um, so your podcast, Everything Iconic, is truly covering everything iconic. You talk a lot about reality TV and Housewives, but you've had like some major guests. You've had like Cameron Diaz to Snooki. You've had the gamut. Yeah, it's been fun to just have some people that I have always dreamed of talking to. I mean, there was a point last year where I interviewed Miss Piggy, like the actual Muppet Miss Piggy. Yeah. And it was just the most crazy thing to me as someone who has always been obsessed with pop culture to be able to talk to some of these people has just been a dream come true. And and I try to just have people that I'm kind of interested in talking to. And, and so, yeah, they kind of run the gamut. I've had a bunch of Real Housewives on, but then I've also had people... Uh, like Rosie O'Donnell or Fran Drescher, or Katie Couric, and and people kind of in the more celebrity space. Um, that's been really fun for me. And then there's certain times where I have a guest on where I I recently had Lisa Ann Walter who plays Chessie in the movie The Parent Trap, and yeah. she's currently on this show called Abbott Elementary, which I think is just brilliant. But sometimes I have someone like that on who's been around the business forever, and it's like they have such good stories and celebrity stories because they've been in movies and TV shows for a hundred years. And so it, it's like some, sometimes someone like that just surprises me because I have so much fun chatting with them. And you're fully independent, right? I'm fully independent. Yeah. I have a, a, a company called a cast that does my ad sales, but yeah. I'm a one man band. So I'm, uh, I produce, I edit, I, rec- I, uh, book, I do all of it myself. And I need, I'm the goal for this year is to change that because it's getting to be a little too much, as you know, it can, it can be very time consuming. And so, yeah, I, the goal for this year is to actually bring people on to, to help. But for um, now it's just me. What was the reason to not sign with the, with the network? Cause I would imagine that at this point networks are trying to sign you or have tried to sign you in the past. You know, I met with networks and one of the things that's hard for me, I mean, I mentioned I want to bring someone on, but it's hard for me to let go of creative control. And I think as I was meeting with certain places, uh, even on the production side, I oftentimes will record an episode and have it out three hours later or a couple hours later, you know, with especially my housewife recaps. And it's hard to do that when you are with a production company because they want the episodes a week in advance or they need time to edit or or whatever. Uh, and then even with booking, it's like, I, I don't want to just book anyone. I try to just book people that I'm interested in talking to. And, and so I don't want to rely on guests. And so I think oftentimes when I met with people, they, they want an exact sort of schedule. So it's, they either want like one episode where it's a, a guest and then one episode where it's just you and it all has to be planned out. And sometimes I'm not that planned out. Sometimes I will record a a recap and then other times someone will reach out to me and be like, do you want to have this person on or do you like, or, or can I come on your show? And I'll be like, yeah, that sounds great. And it'll be a last minute thing. So it's hard for me to let up that creative control. And I, I have just found that I've been able to kind of do it. I've gotten in the zone of editing. I can edit pretty quickly now. And and I know exactly what I like for the final product, but I, I need to work on that. But yeah, so I, it just hasn't made any sense. And then also as uh, from a monetary perspective, having complete ownership of my, tr- of my show was always really important to me. And uh, oftentimes with the podcast world, when you sign with somebody else, they want ownership or they yeah. want partial ownership of the show. And I've never really been interested in giving that up. When I first started my podcast, that I had gone to places and I had, I, I had tried to get this show going with other companies and it never, it, I was turned down. And, and so then once I started getting going and then suddenly people wanted to, uh, to own the show, it, it was like, no, you didn't want to own it before. And now yeah. I'm not going to give up the money because, uh, you know, you want to get on board, but. 
Yeah, you either see the prize that I am up front when you swipe right on Bumble or you don't get me later. Right, swipe right early and you could have had it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so are you, like, what's the long-term vision? What's on the vision board? What's the manifestation? Is it like a Caller Daddy Joe Rogan style deal with Spotify? Is it taking over Watch What Happens Live? Oh my God, I would love like a... The, those call her daddy deals and the Joe Rogan deals are like what were they? They were twenty million or she or call her daddy million? call her daddy was sixty million. Oh Joe Rogan God. was two hundred million. That's wild. Like Insane. I don't at that point, how do you even count the money? Like a hundred million dollars. <laughs> it's like how do you even count that? Um, but and people the, are like, oh well, it's an exclusive deal for many years. I'm like. Sign me for four years for two hundred million. <laughs> I, I, here you go. They can I, have my show. You for can, that much yeah, money you for can. Sure. I will tattoo Spotify's <laughs> logo on my asshole for that. I know, I know. I know. Uh, I'll record live from your asshole if it's yeah. branded with Spotify. If Let's they want to it. give me that money, but I, I think ultimately, I'd love to. I'm working on some TV stuff and and uh, some feature stuff. And I've always been writing and, and writing in the TV and in film world and trying to get some projects off the ground. There's a, a couple of things that I have uh, production companies attached to and, and it's hard to get anything made. And I'm hopeful that one of these days, something will get made in, in that space. But, um, for the meantime, that's the, that's it. That it's just like, keep going with my podcast. And I think, um, ultimately I'd, I'd love to be able to bring it to TV and I'm, I'm working working on that, but I don't know. It, it's hard to know if any of this stuff will happen or. Okay. So or, I have a question for you then because Bethany Frankel just released her book and I know on your podcast, you've interviewed her and she wasn't your favorite interview. Um, but, uh, she just had her book come out. Business is personal. And in the book, she talks about how she had her MGM deal that she says she left the MGM deal because she wanted to have her podcast just be. And to me, I'm like, that's not typically how we do it. Like us in the podcast world, we're trying to achieve a deal with MGM to like have some sort of television production deal. You don't typically leave a TV production deal to go do a podcast, you know, out of your closet without your hair combed and your daughter <laughs> and I, hosting it. I'd imagine too, when she signed the MGM deal, it wasn't exclusive with her podcast. So like oftentimes if you, if, uh, MGM were to come to me or, or you and say, we want to do a production deal, you can specify in there, well, that's not going to be contingent on my, I'm still doing my podcast over here. If you guys want something else, we could do something else. Or if you want to bring the podcast to TV, that's a separate thing. Yeah. Um, well, and yeah. she talks about that in the book, how her deal was specific to television producing. It wasn't even specific to hosting. So she was allowed to host other projects and the podcast wasn't even part of her deal originally. So I'm like, so I don't understand yeah, how so or why sense. you l left to host your, your podcast. I would imagine, and I don't know anything about her business deal, but I would imagine she had a certain amount of time with MGM and I know she I, I wasn't just, wasn't that show on HBO max with yeah. MG or with them. Yeah. So my, I would imagine she had probably an overall deal. Sometimes they'll sign you for two years, let's say. And she probably did that show on HBO max. Again, I have no knowledge exactly of the deal, but from what I know from those kinds of deals, I would imagine it's like two years. And so after the HBO thing didn't work out, she probably didn't love working with them or they didn't love working with her or something. So she might've left it early even knowing that nothing else was going to happen for the rest of that six months that was left on the contract or however long it was. That's my guess. That's what I think happened too. I think it was a shorter term contract. It was more of like a trial. Like we're going to test this reality star and see if she can actually, you know, be of benefit for us in, in launching new television shows. Cause from what she talks about in the book too, she was terrible to work with on the HBO max show and like wanted them like after filming, wanted them to completely recast the entire show after they'd already, Already begun filming um it was a terrible show i mean it was just so i like her in the space of like seeing her day to day yes. and i think she works best in an ensemble where she can just react off of crazy people i think that's where her sweet spot is and so it that show just didn't work i mean i watched every episode of it and it was just an odd it was an odd cast it was an odd everything yeah. and then also it was so fake it was such bullshit. It's like, we know that that person wasn't going to work for her. <laughs> no, but I don't think the person ever did work for her. No, she did. I think like for a week in her Instagram bio, she like said VP of skinny girl. And then like that went away. And then she became like an influencer.
Yeah. And then I think Bethany had said that uh, they couldn't work out the final deal or something. So it's like, it's hard to really feel like that was the right project. But yeah. Listen, in her book, I was reading through it and I'm like, Listen, I'm not, I don't have a skinny girl empire, but a lot of the decisions and a lot of the deals that got screwed up, she does not seem like the smartest business person. But reading the book, I was a little frustrated with some of the decisions that she would make or how impulsive she was and how, you know. Oh, I need to read the book. It's I actually mean, it, really juicy if you're a Housewives Bethany fan. I expected it to be more focused on business, but it's actually, she gets into a lot of Housewives oh, stuff. interesting. You know, I was always very curious about the contract with Bravo because we know that that last season she had uh, decided she wasn't coming back like the night before or something. Yeah. So it was like really up to the last minute, which which sucked for, I always felt bad for production and for the show because it's like, to think that you're to assume that you're going into the season of filming and uh, with Bethany there, who's such an anchor of the show. And then to find out a day before, like that really fucks your production Everything. schedule yeah. up. Like she it's said, not just, she said a big part of the reason was because she, um, they wanted to change a clause in her contract that went from giving her a, a seasonal salary to only paying her for every episode that she appeared in. Since there were like on Atlanta, Nini didn't film a few episodes and then LVP exited early, but they still got their salary for the season. She said that she didn't want to run into some sort of conflict where she would get cut out of episodes. But I don't think there was ever a reality where Bethany would be cut out of episodes. So I don't even know if I believe that. Yeah. Interesting. I need to read the book. I heard her talking on something about the book and it was, it was fascinating to me, but I also didn't know how much of it would just be stuff that I've already heard about her. Yeah. So in your book, you talk a lot of, or you, you have a chapter dedicated to grief Mm -hmm. and you, in a recent interview that I was listening to, listening to talk about how we don't often talk about grief enough And I've become obsessed with the topic going through it myself last year. I love talking to guests about it and just kind of seeing where everybody's at in their different journey of grief because it's something that really never ends. How are you doing in your grieving process today? Well, thank you for saying that. I'm totally fascinated by the subject of grief. And actually in the book, I wasn't planning on getting into a chapter about the loss of my grandmother and and how we all deal with death and specifically in America. I think that's where I'm most familiar with it. And and I think I'm fascinated by religion and grief and how different religions process and handle it in different ways. And there's all these... uh, specific of we do a funeral for this amount of time and then we're expected to go to work back to work at this point and all of these things all of these rules when it comes to losing someone and so i didn't go into that chapter wanting to write i wanted to write silly funny stories that made people laugh and then ultimately i was telling this date story that i didn't realize was about my grief and the loss of my grandmother and i yeah i became obsessed with it and kind of looking at it and i think after analyzing it and we talk about housewives and it's like, I watch now. And, and I was just saying on my show with Lisa Renna, it's like, we know she lost her mom. And I I try to think of like putting myself in her shoes of what it must be like to film a reality show while you're going through the loss of your mother, who we know she's close with. And I would, we all become such a fucking messes when we lose someone close to us. It's like, there's, there's no rhyme or reason to how we're reacting. And I, I think people have outbursts, emotional outbursts, and and in ways that we don't even quite understand how they're related to the loss of someone. It's like you cry and you can cry at random. You can get angry at someone in irrational ways. It's like, there's just all this emotion sort of bubbling up under you that comes out in weird ways. So the idea of filming a reality show seems fucking crazy. And I, I thought that with Meredith, we could see that with Meredith on Salt Lake City last season, she was doing fucking crazy things and acting in crazy ways. And it, what's also really fascinating about the TV world of it all is like in, in her reality, she had just lost a parent. I think Meredith lost her dad or something yeah. right before filming. And they filmed for about three months, but we're watching the show unfold for six months or seven months. And so by the end of the season, as a viewer, we're sort of like, Oh, get over the, get over it. Like you lost this person eight months ago or whatever. But in her reality, it was just three months ago, two months ago. And so, yeah, 
two months after losing a parent, you're going to be fucking crazy. Like you're going to say weird shit. It's so strange though, but I think it's, and I was having this conversation with my aunt yesterday about how like people just don't, like a lot of people, people that haven't gone through it don't understand the timing of it. And here's the thing, even long afterwards, you still have these crazy, like irrational, emotional moments that you don't expect. I remember it was seven weeks after the funeral And I had a friend to me and I remember telling her, like, listen, I'm so sorry. I cannot be a great friend right now. I'm struggling to get out of bed every single day. Um, You know, my anchor, my person, my Bethany of my Real Housewives of New York is gone, you know, and it's unhinging. And I was like, I'm sorry, I can't be a great friend to you right now, but I'm trying my best. And then, you know, eventually it's she was having a conversation with me and she's like, you know, I just I feel like you never really check in on me anymore. And I was like, I we just had a whole conversation about how some fucking loser dude ghosted you. And like, that's the biggest thing in your world this week. And she's just like, you know, like you just don't really ask how I'm doing and I get it. You're going through a loss, but like, it's been like seven weeks now. And like, you really don't talk to me. You know, you really don't like, I just need you to know, like I have stuff going on in my life too. And I was like, wow, some dude didn't finger bang you. Sorry. (laughs) I lost my fucking person. Like, you know, it's just, but, but, but then I was also like, be compassionate and be understanding that she does not know what this is like. She hasn't been here and God forbid one day she will be there and she's going to ex- understand what this process is like. And I don't want anybody to ever go through this process, but we all go through it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an inevitable, inevitable with, with everyone. And, and it, what, what you said was so interesting is like, there's no real timeline for it. And with, with the one chapter I talk about grief with my grandmother, I noticed it had started coming out like years later because I grew up really incredibly close to my grandmother. I mean, she was around always and her and I had a very close relationship, but I had moved away right, bef- right before she had gotten sick with cancer. And so I wasn't around. It was just the point in my life where I was starting to like kind of go out of my, get away from my family. And, and I moved across the country And then she got sick very suddenly and she was sick for under a short period of time. And, and then she passed away and I came back for the funeral. And then I flew back to this new life that I had started across the country. And so I felt like my family, uh, my brothers and my parents, they were around for her in the hospital and they kind of saw her. They had a chance to understand and process losing her. Whereas I felt like I never really did it. Aside from going back, I did the eulogy at her funeral and it's like, I just don't think that I ever really processed it until years later. And then I started to notice it coming out in weird ways. Like when some, when there would be some sort of thing that would remind me of my grandmother and it would come out. And that was, I think throughout the book writing process too, I realized like, oh fuck, you didn't really process it in the ways that you should have. And do you feel like you've been able to kind of process it a lot more now? Yeah, I think just re- that all clicking for me was the what helped me the most of like clicking. Oh, I I never grieved properly with that, and just that clicking yeah. really is what did it for me. And it wasn't like I needed some long period of time, or I didn't need you know a seven day. Um, prayer or something like that. It was just like, I just needed to understand, Hey, you didn't really, you didn't really ever process losing grandma Rose. Did the, the writing process in the book help you kind of come to that realization? Or was that something you came to and then wrote about? I came to it and wrote about it. Actually, weirdly enough, it happened on my podcast. I was interviewing this woman, Teresa, um, Caputo, oh, Caputo for the Long Island medium, medium, which I, I like went into the interview kind of interested in her, but I was, I didn't believe in like that sort of yeah. ghosts and spirits and all that kind of stuff. I was fascinated by this woman who built a career being a medium. Yeah. And then she started stuff about my grandma came up in the interview and she's like, Oh, your grandma's here and all this stuff. And I fucking lost. I was so embarrassed. Oh, yeah. And I almost didn't put out the episode because I was so embarrassed. Cause I, it wasn't just like a little cry. It was like an ugly cry that yeah. started to happen. And that was kind of the moment where I was like, Oh fuck. Like you lost it. Like I, I, was a crying mess on this interview with the Long Island medium who I thought like, I was like, this is so stupid. (laughs) And I just was like a nutball. And so that was, I think the point where I was like, Oh, okay. You need to look at this and just try to maybe see what's going on. And it, it also, that specific incident happened at a time where one of my very best friends lost his brother, who I also grew up with and knew 
my whole life. And he was very young in his twenties, uh, died suddenly. And so it was like connecting all those dots at the same time. And, and that was what did it for me. It's yeah. it's interesting grief. And I, I, I loved when you said like we just we don't talk about it enough. And it's so I mean, we talk about, you know, bleaching our assholes more than we talk right. about losing right. somebody and how unhinging it is. Like literally a person exists and then the next day they're just physically gone. And like wrapping your head around that concept is so strange. The ever, we all think we're so fragile and so we're afraid to talk about it. And then, like I said, these traditions around losing someone where it's like you have the funeral, you have the wake or you have the whatever it is and you're allowed to talk about it then. Yeah. But then two weeks later, it's, it's like, done. oh, you're, he's still talking about it or you're still talking about it. Yeah, I'm and... still talking about it because it's it, it's the rest of my fucking life. Like that's that's really the reality of it, you know? Yeah. And I I still have both my parents around, but I can only imagine that when you lose your parent or if you, I I mentioned my friend losing a a brother really young or, or uh, losing a child. It's like, that's, I can't even imagine. I mean, the emotional toll, it it goes, that happens in your brain. Uh, But in general, we don't talk about it. There's so many things that we don't talk about enough. I mean, we, uh, uh, mental health, we don't, there's things that are just these like taboo subjects where, we're all kind of tiptoeing around them in so many ways. And I think if we just talked about them and, and we're able to reference them honestly and openly in a way that doesn't make them as these fragile things, I think it would help us all. I agree. I agree, Danny. Okay. Are you I ready? Feel bad to, I, see, even just talking about it now, I feel bad for your listeners. I'm like, oh man, I came on this podcast. Did I just talk about grief too much? No, I talk, I brought it up. up I brought it up because I feel like we need to talk about it a lot more and we need to like normalize these things. Um, because it's like, I mean, I love talking about it because to me, I even love crying about it because first of all, I've become a big fucking crier ever since, you know, it happened. I'm like, I did never cried this much in my entire fucking life, but I feel like it's important to talk about. And I like crying about it too, because to me, it's just a testament of how much love there still is, you know, mm-hmm. and how mm-hmm. important mm-hmm. that was. Um, Nothing better than a good cry too. I mean, it's like, Oh my God, it's better than an orgasm. Mm-hmm. It's so mm-hmm. much more cathartic. It lasts so much longer. The sleep, I will, I totally yes. agree with you. The sleep after a cry to me is b- even better than sleep after good sex. It's like yes. that you will, I, I, I'm an anxious person in general. So it's like my, I never really feel like I get the greatest sleeps, but after I cry, I'm out like a lamp. Yes. When Courtney Kardashian was just like, I'm fine. I just cry myself to sleep every night. I'm like, but don't you sleep so much better now? <laughs> It's true. It's exhausting. It's, it takes a lot out of you. Well, it's cathartic. So you are mm-hmm. able to rest at ease because right. you've released all of that emotion that you've been harboring. Um, okay. I do want some of your hot takes because you okay. do cover okay. everything iconic. Are you ready? Let's do it. Yeah, let's do okay. it. Okay. First up, Brittany's wedding. How iconic and how surprised were you that her mother and sister were not present? I was not surprised that the mom and sister weren't present. I think I was most surprised at just how small it seemed. Uh, and then also, I think there were people there that I knew that I, I was surprised for being how small it was. I was surprised that Kathy Hilton was there and that uh, Selena Gomez. It's like, I kind of thought maybe they, those kinds of people had showbiz relationships with her, but I didn't know they would be at this like very intimate wedding. But it was so exciting to see that one photo of of Drew Barrymore and Donatella and Madonna and Britney and Selena. It was, I mean, come on, like that photo, I felt like just that morning was so exciting. Everywhere on the internet, that photo was showing up. That was a very iconic group of, of women. Um, I did, it was a very like a casual way. Like the fact that her ex was just able to kind of stroll right in while Instagram living the whole thing. That was fucked up. Yeah. And then the photos of like, you know, them with like the broom and all the stuff in the background. Like it was, there not like an art, an assistant and art, like somebody that could have just (laughs) shuffled this together a little. Um, But it's, it was a very Britney wedding. But I think that's what she needed and that's what made her happy. And so like, yeah, people are going to talk shit about it on Twitter, but I'm like, but like, look at she's happy, you know? Oh, yeah. I see. To me, the wedding was appealing in the low in the low expectation of it all. Like that's I I don't love the big, huge wedding thing. I think it 
it's cra- it's gotten crazy the way that people treat weddings. And so I like that. It was like, yeah, we're having it at the house. And uh, it was, it seemed like pretty easy to throw together. Like yeah. I, I looked at, it, I was like, Oh, I could, I feel like I could throw that together in a week. And I love that about it. Would you have a wedding? Do you no, plan I don't on know. having my, a wedding? My boyfriend, my boyfriend and I have been together for like 12 years now. And we technically got engaged like five years ago, um, but we never, we were just at the place in our lives. We didn't have the money or the, uh, we were both trying to build our careers and all that stuff. So we just, I think we started wanting a wedding. And then as the years went by, it was like, okay, well, we don't want that anymore um, in terms of like the big ceremony of it all. So I think one day we'll go to a courthouse or we'll do a Vegas thing or something, but um, I don't think we'll do a big wedding because neither one of us want that. And and it's been so many years now. It's just like, okay, well, he's stuck with me. I'm stuck with him. We're good. And we're happy. <laughs> like we don't, we don't need the big ceremony. So you, would you do a Britney Spears? Home I would do that. Yeah. I would do that kind of small something along those lines. Like if we do anything, it'll be I, lo- I love the idea of going to Vegas because it's easy for everyone to get to. So I could tell my parents are all in Ohio, his family's in Kentucky. So it's like easy to get people there because it's a cheap, cheap flights and easy hotels and you don't have to entertain people. My brother, older brother, one of them did a destination wedding here in California. So it was, it was kind of easy for me, but for all of his friends and family, it was, it was just hard to get everyone out there. And then they had to have all this stuff planned the whole weekend for people. And I don't want to have to like, I don't want to worry about other people. If people flew out to Vegas, like they could just play at the slot machine yeah. third day. I don't have to think about them. Go to the strip So I like club. that idea. Yeah, they can yeah go, strip, go to Thunder from down under and have a good time. Um, what are your thoughts on this Hills reboot with a whole new cast? Will it be iconic or do you think we need to leave the series alone at this point? You know, I'm someone who watched all of the Hills new beginnings, which was just terrible. Like it was terrible. I can't even stress that enough, but I watched every single episode and it was, it was so frustrating because there was good stuff in there. Is it the same production company that's doing the new one? I believe so. Okay. Because that, I just felt like it, it was produced oddly to me. And so I hope that they do a better job. I guess that's, if it's the same production company, I hope they do a better job, but uh, yeah, I think they should leave it alone. I think the trick is going to be finding people that have an organic relationship with each other. I mean, even that's what works best on Bravo is when it's a group of friends or people that have connections and organic connections with each other. And the reboot felt like they didn't, even though they had spent all that time filming the original, it felt like, who, it was like, why are we bringing Misha Barton in here? Why are Brandon um, Lee? Lee, it was, was strange. It was very obviously cast. And then, um, so with the new one, I think that's going to be the trouble or, or going to be the the thing. And, and the original was lightning in a bottle too. And I think it came at a time where reality TV, we were looking for something a little bit different and had like a glossy sheen to it. Whereas I don't know if that is enough to get people on board anymore. I mean, Selling Sunset uh, is done by the original creator of The Hills. And I feel like that's stylistically so similar, but even that I'm surprised that Selling Sunset works as well as it does. I love it, but it's sort of surprising that it's taken on such a huge success. Do you think Christine Quinn should have been invited to the MTV Awards? Was she not? She was not. She was, she was disinvited not. because she ended up talking out about the producer. And Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I did read that. You know, I'm pissed about the Christine Quinn of it all because to me, she is that show. She's the, the woman who all the storylines revolve around. I don't know how they go forward without Christine. They need her. I don't think it's going to work if at this point they're going to either have to bring Christine back, which seems like now there's all this bad blood with everyone and Christine. And I feel like the other option is to bring someone else in to stir the pot. But I think that'll feel so disingenuous at this point in season six to be bringing in some pot stir that's clearly there to replace Quint, uh, Christine. And so I don't know how that's going to work, but they need her. And, yeah. and I I like all the other women, but it's like nobody else is bringing anything to that show. It's like it's Christine's show. And I think the dynamic between Chriselle and Christine and I love Chriselle. But I think Chriselle works best with Christine there. Yeah. And there's no Christine Cavallari that they can come and replace Lauren Conrad with to revamp the show in some way. Um, 
I don't know. I'm reading Christine's book right now. And I don't know. I've developed like a new, I'm newer to the Selling Sunset franchise, but I'm, I'm subscribing to that vibe. My favorite thing about the show is just the houses. I mean, I love just looking at the the prices and when they show, I love when they show the price and then they show the different rooms and stuff. So I like the real estate porn of that show. It's shot really beautifully and yeah, it's, it's low drama, but I still need some drama. I still need some. And that's why we need Christine there. Cause I just don't think it works without her. And some of the other women, it's like half the cast. I'm like, what are we in? No, they wouldn't last on any other show, but like for some reason on selling sunset they're they've been around for six seasons. And I'm like, what are we doing? <laughs> Nobody really knows them. Well, you know, Chris and you know, Christine. Yeah. It's like Chris and Christine are that show. Yeah. And then there's, you know, Davina's an interesting side character because she's like sort of a little awkwardly villainous. And I think there's, uh, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by some of the other women for like a minute, but for the most part, Roman, I'm fascinated by Mary and Roman because he's hot, but like, that's it. (laughs) Uh, Do you think it's time to revamp or reboot Vanderpump Rules with a new cast? I don't know that. An, I, I don't know what to do with Vanderpump Rules. You know, I'm I, I'm sort of in favor of them coming back for another season because so many of the dynamics have seemingly changed off screen. My worry is that there's all this upheaval. You know, Katie and Tom broke up. They moved out of the house and uh, James and Raquel broke up. And I'm interested in seeing them single. But I, I, I think this will be the make or break season. But I said that last year, too. And then we had a bad season. I thought last season, I was like, okay, we're losing half the cast, but maybe it'll be a good refresh. But then it felt like they didn't do anything with the refresh. So that's my concern is, is similar to last season. Like, I hope we're not just going into the season uh, assuming that we're going to get this big refresh and then they're going to give us the same old tired antics that they did last season. Because I think we want as viewers to just see the realness of it. And sometimes they lean too far into like the lizard funeral, you know, yeah. um, it's like they got so far away from those early dynamics. And I don't know that we could go back. I mean, the cast is so different now. And do you think we I, bring back some of the originals? Look, I don't know. I don't know. I, I I don't think they even want to come back. The yeah, you know, Stassi like, said. Yeah, Stassi said she has no interest in coming back. I don't think Jax will come back. I think his ego's too big, which ca- cancels out Britney. And I don't think just bringing <laughs> which back, which cancels out Britney. I love that you said that. <laughs> which, um, <laughs> which, and Kristen. I don't think she's a strong. She was good, but she was good with the witches of WeHo, and I don't think she's a strong enough cast member to bring back as just like the we're bringing back Kristen, you know? Yeah. Now I don't know that they'll, I don't think that any of them will come back and, but I don't know that. I don't know if the current cast there, there seemed to be enough people last season. It just felt off. And so I hope that this new season is good. And we have all this weird stuff, like the idea of seeing Tom and Katie single and kind of dating. That's fascinating to me. Yeah, I've never seen them single, but then I worry that like, did we miss the moment because yeah. they we're not going to see the breakup play out. It's all of a sudden we're going to open on them in we, new places. They've already moved out of the house. I, I'm is, sure they filmed some of it. I think that was the mistake they made with this last season is there was so much time that went by that we didn't address anything. We didn't address the firings. We didn't address any of them becoming parents. Like none of that was tackled in the new season. And it was just kind of like, we're starting up again a year later as if this whole past year or so that we didn't film never happened. I was most upset last season. We didn't address the firings because it was like, that's the reality of what happened. And I I mentioned this a bunch of times on my show, but like my, my brothers and their wives watch Vanderpump Rules, but they don't follow all the social media of it all. And We came back last season and it was like half the original cast was gone and they never once explained it. My brother called me and was like, what's going on? He doesn't listen to my podcast or anything. He's like, "We, what happened to Jax? And what happened to, like, they were just fucking confused. And it was so bizarre to me from just a production standpoint that like it would never even be, even at the reunion, they didn't really talk about this stuff. And it was like, how fucking nuts. The biggest storyline that happened with all of you which could have been interesting. And to see, I would have loved to 
break the fourth wall and find out like, well, were they worried about their jobs? The people who did come back yeah. or how do they feel about like going on and still being friends with these people? And we know those of us who do follow social media, we're also confused. It's like, cause we know that these people are still friends and hang out, but none of them are talking about it on the show. It was like so fucking bizarre to me. Like no one wanted to address the elephant in the room. Well, especially cause it's not just like one housewife that got fired, you know, right. where like maybe they make a cameo in the future or whatever. But like when that kind of happens, they introduce somebody new and like, you don't really think about the housewife not coming back. But in this sense, it was such a big cultural moment that they were fired that Everybody was talking. It was in variety. Like it was everywhere that it's like we just glossed. But not only that, but we also glossed over the fact that they all got pregnant at the same time and all had kids. Like we just came back and all of a sudden everybody has a baby and we're just moms now. And it's like there was no gap between the last season and this season. And especially because the last season had so many different people that were also incorporated that also just disappeared. It was wild to me the way that that was that was done. And that's my worry for this next season. It's like, from what I understand, I think they're filming some stuff already and, and maybe the official filming has already begun, but I think over the summertime, they've maybe filmed a few things here and there. So hopefully we'll at least get some, like seeing Katie and Tom before they move out of that house and, and maybe seeing some of the Raquel James fallout. But I, I'm worried that we're just going to jump in and it'll be like, Tom's at his new apartment and Katie's at her new place. And, uh, we're not even, uh, there's no understanding of what happened, you yeah. know, or, or it'll be like a quick off the cuff thing. Like, so we broke up and then they move on to some overly produced sitcom opening or lizard funeral or some yeah. bullshit like that. It's like, give us the good, the, what happened? I want to know what happened. Cause we're invested in their relationships more than we're invested in their antics. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So I hope it's good, but I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. I was hopeful for last season. I thought, okay, this is a good chance for the show to reboot. I also think pairing down uh, before last season, that cast was too fucking big. So I thought pairing down the cast would be good because we'll be able to really dive into the storylines, but then it was just kind of like, eh. And the Lala and Randall, there's so much Lala Randall, interesting stuff too, that I, are we going to see any of it? I don't know. Probably not, because at this point, it's all so done, and she's done so many interviews about it, and she did a whole tour about it. Lala and Randall, James and Raquel, Katie and Tom, like, those would have all been such compelling stories that we would have been invested in watching week after week that we didn't, I don't know, I feel like you're right, we we missed the mark a little bit, but we'll see. Maybe it'll be a good season. I know. I'm not really, like... I'm hopeful, but I'm not super hopeful. Yeah. You know, just because I feel like they've let us down too many times. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of letting us down, Neve Campbell has just announced that she will not be joining Scream 6 over salary disputes. Do you think that they should pull the money together to make it happen? Yeah, you know, I think I love the Scream franchise. In the last movie, I think we could have had Nev take off for this upcoming one. Like, I don't think we needed her for the for the new one. With that said, she is the franchise and and I think some other cast members or previous cast members from the Scream franchise have come out and said this, but it's like, if this was a male led franchise, they would not lowball the men yeah. in the same way that they would lowball a, a woman. And so I do think that they should have given her the money. Um, my personal taste for those movies is I want more Gale. Like I, yes, uh, I love, Cox. yes, I am a bigger Gale fan. Yeah, me too. It's like, I love Gale and I, I think they've watered Gail down too much. I need Gail to just be an asshole and I need her to get back to sort of that, like um, the first three movies, how like ruthless and mean Gail was. Cause I, I love that. And I feel like she's, they've morphed Gail into Courtney Cox. And it's like, I love Courtney Cox so much. And I just want, I want that vibe to come back. And I know the character's grown and whatever, but now that Dewey's gone, she's, I need her to just be an asshole again. So my hope for the next one is that like they expand on Gail. <laughs> so, so do you think Courtney Cox would come back without, um, without Sydney? Well, is there a Gail I without think, Sydney? I think Gail is coming back. And to me, it makes also more sense for Gail to come back because in the last movie, I think largely what brought the Sydney character back into the mix was the was Dewey. And she even said that in the movie, like, I'm only back in Woodsboro because of Dewey. Like, and we've lost Dewey. So I think that's gives the writers uh, an angle. But with that said, I'm I'm concerned about the whole production. If 
if what the leaks have said where the Sydney character was a main part of the plot and to find out much like Bethany leaving New York at the last minute to find out at the last minute, they're not getting Nev Campbell back. That's going to fuck up the writing of it. It's going to screw up production and they don't have the time because this is a big franchise film. They don't have time to really take a big break to refocus this. And so my concern is it's just going to be shitty largely because there's no time to rewrite it that you perfectly do you think um, there's an opportunity to give her what she's asking for and bring her back in? My hope is that the public outcry sort of makes Paramount, is it Paramount or I don't know who owns it, but uh, makes them rethink and and just give her the money. But I don't know what the money she wanted was. And and yeah, I think Matthew Lillard said like, Tom, Tom, they wouldn't do that to Tom Cruise on Mission Impossible or Top Gun or whatever. Yeah. And obviously those are even bigger franchises, but I think- um, I think it's important to keep Nev at least in the world of the franchise because the minute, especially the horror movies, when they start losing the Jamie Lee Curtis or the Nev yeah. Campbells, they flop and they're bad. And these are the stars of these movies. So while I think that they don't necessarily need her for the story, I need them to keep her around. Yeah. Does that make sense? For the heart of it, at least. Yeah, she's the heart of it. But I need more Gail. We need more Gail. I I want to see now that Gail is grieving the loss of Dewey. We need an unhinged emotionally. She, yeah, yes. You know, yes. just yes. We need that Gail. She was always such an asshole, and that's why that's what we loved about her. Yeah. Remember Gail, super bitch. You know that was the line from the first movie. It's like I need super bitch Gail to come back back you, out. How much do you, do you feel about? Um, Drew Barrymore being like an iconic part of the Scream franchise, even though she was only in like three minutes of, of the entire series. Wait, did you know that she also was like in the last one? She was the voice of the principal or something in the high school. So I she didn't did know that. She came back in the last one and did like a little voice. I, you can like barely hear it in the background, I think. But uh, yeah, that I mean, her opening is is everything. And and yeah, I I got a chance to do her show and like talk to her and yeah. sort of interview her about the Scream franchise. And she said she still has that Bob wig, which was uh, modeled after Michelle Pfeiffer and Scarface. Like that's what she wanted. Um, And she was supposed to be, I think they offered her the Nev Campbell role and she wanted to do that other one. Um, And she had said like that she, I I don't want to misquote, but essentially that she should have gotten a producer credit on that first one because she was the one who sort of uh, had brought the movie you know, to Wes and to, you know, she had sort of helped shape that, that first one a little bit and, and get it out there. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, that first movie is so good. I love the second one too, though. I mean, the first two to me are the best. Yeah, I agree. How much are you looking forward to ultimate girls trip Two? Oh my God. I can't wait. I can't wait. The things that I've heard, Zach, have you, you've heard, I've heard a lot of things and it sounds wild. Wait, this is interesting. I want to talk to you about this. So you hear, we hear things, right? Yeah. Like people DM, they send things. Do you ever worry? It's hard to know what's true sometimes and what's not. And sometimes as I'm sure you feel, and I'm curious to hear your opinions on this, but like do housewives must reach out to you too. And I think sometimes housewives will reach out to us and they want us to leak something or they want us to whatever. And it's hard to know what's true and what's not. And, and I, just assume everything's a lie because I'm like, Oh, they're just trying to get this out or whatever. But I want to know your thoughts on it. I do have housewives that DM me and I do have housewives from multiple, not, you know, any show specifically, but reality stars in general that will bring information to me or they'll try to use my podcast. Cause my podcast, I am, I'm pretty sure your podcast has been featured on like Bravo shows before. I know like some of the interviews, you know, get played on, on the shows. I think we were even in the last season of Vanderpump with the fight between Ariana and Lala. Um, so I think the cast members see that like no filter makes headlines and pushes storylines. So sometimes certain cast members from certain shows will reach out and try to like utilize me or my show to kind of push certain narratives or whatever. So I'm always very cognizant of what I'm willing to believe or even when they give me like inside tea about what's to come for the upcoming season. I'm always like, let me try to verify, like, let me pretend I'm a real journalist and not a podcast <laughs> journalist. And let me try to verify some of these things before 
or just, you know, spewing it out there. Because for me, I call it low budget tea. And there's so much low budget tea on Twitter and so much low budget tea on Instagram. And all these people like this Kathy Hilton assistant person that will just come out with like the most outlandish, just like things that are not based in reality. Um, And it's really because there's a personal objective behind it. Right. Um, So I always try to like verify things and be very frugal or when I do talk about it on the podcast I'll be like this is a rumor like I hate blind items I don't know if you Me too. I, I hate know, I blind too. items and Demois They've is like out of hand and Demois is like hemorrhoids in my asshole like it's just like <laughs> it's all unverified it's all speculation it's all and then everybody just wants to reveal all of these rumors and then they just use the word alleged and to me I'm just like that's the most over like it doesn't mean anything and so and so is not going to care about you spreading some low budget rumor on Twitter. You don't need to say allege. Like it's so silly to me. And the Bravo stuff has oftentimes as you'll hear things, then you'll see something on Twitter, something that somebody says happens in the new season. It's like, that's not at all what happens. And I, yeah, I, it, sometimes people will believe anything or, or they're, yeah, they put out these crazy blind items that you're like, oh, this is, I can't believe everyone's sharing this or believing this or whatever. I hate when I wake up to a flood of DMs and it's like, did you see this story? And I'm like, oh my God, like how, like, why are we believing any of this? Like, I hate, yeah. I hate blind items. Yeah. They'll be crazy. Like Cindy Barship is coming back to the Real Houses of New York and she's going to be the star of the show and you're reading it and you're like, this is so not true. So not true. <laughs> it's like crazy. But yeah, it's it's fascinating and I, I'm always interested to talk to other podcasters and stuff with their experience because it does happen a lot. And, and my show, I, I'm just trying to make people laugh and stuff. So I, I feel like I'm not really even, you know, although I interview people sometimes, it's like, I'm mostly just trying to make people laugh. But still sometimes people will come to me with information and want me to, it's like very clear. They want me to share it or yeah. kind of, or maybe they're sharing it with like a bunch of us, you know, that I'm sure sometimes the housewives will, will reach out to a bunch of us and like say, Oh, well this happens this season. And, and it's like, I know they want us to get it out there. Right. 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 And so, yeah. And a lot of the times I don't and very, you know, if I can verify something and I think it's a juicy enough piece, cause I also mm-hmm. don't want to like kill storylines either. Cause I feel like then that ruins the show for just the audience members. And it's so much different when you're recapping or you're analyzing or reviewing these shows, because then your lens is not just an average viewer enjoying the show anymore, you know? Right. Right. Because you'll be thinking, oh, well, this happens later down the road or this, you know. Yeah. But it's it's the housewives world that we're in that we love and love to hate, love to hate and yes. love to love. Yes. Um, speaking of unverified rumors, what do you think of the rumors about the season three of, of Ultimate Girls Trip that's supposed to be filming this summer in Thailand? OK, well, you know, I haven't seen part two yet. Season two. But well, it's I not do because it's not out yet. I know, but I do prefer that we get some crazier housewives in there. And well, I say that lovingly. Yes. Uh, because season one, I thought it was great, but we can't do that season again. I don't think it was like that was right. a one time thing. It was nice and fun, whatever. But no one's going to like, re- I don't think anyone's going to rewatch season one of Ultimate Girls Trip. It was no. like great for what it was. So I do need some more chaos. I think the the sort of going forward with Ultimate Girls Trip is going to be the chaos. That's what's going to make me return to Peacock to put it back on because I'm always soothed by the women yelling at each other or, or arguing about nonsense. Uh, so I hope that we have chaos. Who is the cast that so is rumored for season three? These are the names. Leah McSweeney. Okay. Heather Gay. Whitney Rose. Lisa Barlow. These are all the names that are out there that are contenders. Karen Huger, Giselle Bryant, Robin Dixon, Alexia Napola from Miami, Marisol from Miami, Erica Jane, Lisa Rinna, Kim Richards. Now, I've looked into these. I can confirm that Erica Jane, Lisa, and Lisa Rinna are definitely not doing it. And Heather Gay might not do it, be- which is why Lisa Barlow's name is in the mix. Heather Gay is supposed to be filming pickup scenes with Jen Shaw during her trial in July, which is when they're supposed mm. to be filming this in Thailand. So Heather Gay, I don't think, has been fully confirmed. The others are kind of all just up in the air. Well, I do like the idea of we need to bring in Potomac, Miami, and Salt Lake City into the ultimate girls trip world. So I do like that part of it. The idea of having Karen and Giselle together around 
uh, other women from other franchises. I mean, that's delightful. The idea of getting Alexia near some of these other women is so exciting to me. I think Alexia is one of the greatest housewives yes. of any franchise. So yeah, I, I'm excited by this cast. Um, I'm not. I'm actually really bored by this. This is not an ultimate girls trip I would care to watch. We need some more chaos in there, right? Like yeah. we need we need a wild card. We have Kim Richards, it's names in there, but I don't think she's healthy enough to... Like, we haven't seen her in a minute, and the last time we saw her, she was, like, cracked out on Cameo, and I don't know if she's doing well. We need someone... I I always think you need a Brandy Glanville or yeah. Taylor Armstrong or, or Dorinda or Vicky, Tamara. Like, we need those... I mean, the, season two, to me, is just, like, the most chaotic people they could possibly find they yeah. threw together, which is exciting. But yeah, we need some of that chaos. So I tweeted over the weekend about this very hot debate that is taking over Twitter that I need you to weigh in on. Who do you think would win in a Beverly Hills showdown? Erica Jane versus Kim Richards. I saw this tweet and I, it's been sitting with me and um, wow. (laughs) Ultimately, Kim at her best, I think would win. Uh, ultimately, because yeah, yeah, I love Kim. When Kim, when she's at her healthiest, would for sure. And also, I think Kim has a way of talking circles around people. And I guess Erica Jane does this too. So I don't know. They might just go in circles around each other talking and I, saying the craziest things. I think Kim I think is ultimately just, Kim. I think Kim is just like ruthless. And when she's going mm. in, she goes all the way in where I think Erica would reach a point of like, she's crazy. Like, have you seen the clip of her on, what was it? M- the mother daughter experiment where she, her <laughs> and Natalie, she's like in her face and she's like taking her sweater off. And I'm like, and she's like, don't take your sweater off, Kim. Do not take your sweater off. And Kim's like, I'm taking my sweater off and getting in your face. Like Kim will just go there. And there's something to be said about the things that Kim has gone through. She's been through it all. So she's not scared of any, no. she's not scared of the law. She's not scared. She's no. been through it. Like Erica is maybe in the process of going through some of that stuff. Uh, but Kim has, she's seen divorces. She's seen arrests. Murders. She's been through arrests, murders. She's, she's seen and done it all. Have you read so House of Hilton? Scared. Have I what? Read House of Hilton? No, no, but I, I have done some heavy research into the Hilton family and it's very fascinating. Oh, we're doing House of Hilton for our Bravo book club. Um, and it is wild. Again, I don't know how much of it I entirely believe because a lot of it's just like retelling from like fr- family friends and like, you know, coworkers and stuff. But it is fascinating. I mean, that family, it's all fascinating. I mean, there's, I can only imagine the skeletons in all of their closets and, and the things that this family has seen and done. It's, it's captivating. I agree. But and big Kath and and Kyle and little Kath and Kim. I mean, ah, uh, it's so juicy. But I just Kim is someone I root for indefinitely. Like to me, I just want the best for her. I think she ultimately has like such a good heart, and she seems like such a nice person. And I don't always feel that way. Some of the other chaotic housewives, I don't really feel like they're maybe good people. But Kim, I ultimately she's done some crazy shit and and made mistakes and everything. But ultimately, I think in her heart, she's a good human being. Yeah. And she just makes mistakes. And so I think that's why I root for her so much. Yeah. I think she's just lost is really what it yeah. is. And who wouldn't be? Yeah. Uh, they put her fucking through the ringer to make money for that whole family. I know from a very young age. And, you know, I also root for a Kim acting comeback because she's a really good actress. And I feel like she just needs some sort of role. Like somebody needs to give her just a, I mean, a good scene and some sort of indie. She had, uh, she had Sharknado. I know. (laughs) Did you ever see, there's a clip that I found of her in that movie, Black Snake Moan with um, Samuel L. Jackson and Christina Ricci. And Kim plays Christina Ricci's mother in it. And she's got this scene at the grocery store. And it's like, Kim is doing a great job in the scene. Like she's a good actress. And even in her earlier work, you see that, that, but I think, we haven't seen her do much acting recently, but she still has the chops. And I feel that way about Kyle too. I mean, Kyle was to me the best part of the last Halloween movie. Yeah. I feel like they, that family has acting chops and, 
if they just, you know, people hate Kyle too. I know people hate her with like a passion, but her act, you can't, you got to give it up for her Kyle. acting. I don't get why people hate Kyle. I don't, under, that to me, I don't understand. It was funny though, in the, one of the recent episodes of Beverly Hills where Lisa Rin is sitting down at lunch with Kyle and she's like, Kyle, you're in the number one movie in America right now. It's the number one movie. I'm like, no, no, no. Kyle's the reason it's the number one movie. I don't know if her role is as important enough to be, you know, an anchor in that movie for housewives fans yes in the next movie i hear she has a much bigger more prominent role in it um but i just found it funny that rena was just like it's the number one movie you're the star of the number one yeah. like mm, it's a halloween franchise with jamie lee curtis it's I don't jamie think- lee yeah. yeah wait can i say something controversial this might get me in trouble zach i'm, hashtag I'm not no proud filter. of what i'm about to say go for it but hashtag no filter i also think that lisa rena is a good actress and yeah. I would like to see her in some sort of other scripted soap opera world. I know she did like like that Beyond Salem and the, she's done some soap. I would like to see her on like a nighttime soap that's not reality because I think she's really good at that. And uh, I people hate her as well. I know people feel very passionately against her, but I think she's also a good actress. And I mean, Garcelle too is a great, some of yeah. these women, I would like to see them outside of this unscripted world and kind of get back into like a juicy limited series. Like wouldn't you love Garcelle to just do like a six episode, I don't know, HBO max crime drama. I liked (laughs) Rinna when she did her beyond Salem little cameo where she, um, I think, with Rinna, she needs a break from Housewives. I think it's hitting her, and this is what we see of her on social media a lot lately, right? I think it's hitting her too hard, and I think it's because she recently lost her mother, and like we talked about, you get vi- very unhinged and very emotional, and you don't really think things through. But I also think the world of Housewives is very challenging and difficult to just navigate overall that I think she needs something outside of housewives that can kind of really distract her so that when she comes and does housewives, it's a mm-hmm. fun, lighthearted break from her real job. Yeah. And all the women, I think, benefit from a break. I think it's good to take a season or two off. I think then we root for them a little bit more when they come back. I feel that way about Sheree. Sheree's come back twice. And towards the end of both of her tenures, I think it's been like, "Uh, I don't know if we need Sheree. But then she comes back and I'm like, oh, I'm so excited to see her. I missed her. Yeah. I agree. I like Sheree. Danny Pellegrino, thank you so much for coming on Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter. Thank you, Zach. This was so fun. I, I, I could have talked to you forever. I appreciate you having me. Well, we'll need to do it again. Everybody go and listen to Everything Iconic, hosted by Danny Pellegrino, available on all podcast platforms. And it's also on YouTube, right? You release video episodes or clips. The interviews are all on YouTube. Yeah, youtube.com slash Danny Pellegrino and the number one. Love it. And be sure to get his New York Times bestselling book, How Do I Unremember This? Unfortunately, True Stories that are very fortunately very funny. So definitely go and give Danny some love and some support. Slide into his DMs, but nothing dirty because he's got a man. But tell him how much you want to see his wedding, his Britney Spears (laughs) wedding broadcast on Instagram Live one of these days. Oh my God, no, no, no. (laughs) Thank you guys for listening to Hashtag New Fields with Zach Peter. That's me. You can give me a follow at Just Plain Zach. If you don't give a shit about me, but you want all the reality TBT, give us a follow at No Filter with Zach. And stay tuned for new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube for full episodes of the podcast at youtube.com slash just plain Zach and order some no filter wine head over to nofilterwine.com to stock up 13% alcohol by volume but less than a gram of sugar so you will be litty city but no gnarly wine headache drink responsibly 21 and over to older 21 or older to order that's what I legally have to say so go enjoy your summer all right guys love you mean it bye